Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're gonna be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I gonna marry? What kind of life am I gonna live? How am I gonna raise my kids? What am I gonna do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. I was doing a retreat for deacons in the Archdiocese of Hartford, Connecticut a while ago, and I met Deacon Tom Cabine, who is our guest today. And I was really fascinated to find out that Deacon Tom was a Jehovah's Witness, and he was actually working in headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, in the Watchtower, and, uh, and he ended up becoming a Catholic. And I just thought it'd be so interesting to, to hear his story and to share it with you. So welcome, Deacon Tom. Well, thank you very much, Ralph. I uh, am very honored to be here. I look at your list of uh, guests, and uh, they are very, very uh, involved in various kinds of ministries. I, uh, I have a story to tell. I don't have any ministry that I've started. I haven't written any books or anything, but uh, I believe that I was brought through journey that I took for a reason, and yeah. uh, so maybe I can help uh, share some oh, of the things I've Oh, absolutely. We have lots of guests who don't have <clears throat> ministries, but have a story to tell about how God's acted in their life. Well, let's, let's start with, uh, I think a lot of people have a, a secret admiration and curiosity and, and fascination about Jehovah's Witnesses because there's hardly anybody probably watching the program today or listening who has, hasn't had people knock on their door who are Jehovah's Witnesses and maybe leave them a little pamphlet or something. So tell us how you became a Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, what, what, what they really believe, and, and what happened to lead you to become a Catholic. All right. Uh, of course, this is a very long story, and uh, this could last for hours, but uh, we'll boil it down. Yeah, we've uh, got to boil it down to 26 was, <laughs> minutes. Okay, good. I was uh, three years old when my parents uh, were contacted indirectly through my uh, maternal grandmother uh, was uh, attracted to Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, they, uh, my dad had very little religion at all. He was actually a cowboy. We lived in Arizona on mm. a ranch, mm. and uh, he uh, had not any kind of religion. Uh, and my mother was a nominal Methodist. Uh, she went to church mostly for social reasons. Uh, but when they heard the preaching of Jehovah's Witnesses, they accepted it uh, lock, stock, and barrel. And uh, my, my, my parents became traveling, or actually sort of what you'd call in other religions, church planters. So well, my dad was sent to uh, Cottonwood, Arizona in 1955 mm -hmm. to start a, a congregation there. And uh, How did it happen for them? Did somebody <laughs> knock on their door? No. Uh, we had uh, some friends, very close friends, that lived in a duplex that my dad had built, and uh, they they were uh, contacted by the witnesses, and they got involved in what they call a Bible study, and mm -hmm. uh, they invited my parents. To I say, yeah, and yeah. Uh, that's. Uh, I think most people, uh, although the, it's very uh, common for people to be aware of the door-to-door -door, uh, witnessing. Uh, I think the very small percentage of people who are witnesses actually become witnesses as a result of the door-to-door -door witnessing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a thing that they do, but uh, most people come into the organization through friends, relatives, I some see. work contacts or something like oh, that. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. think that their door-to-door -door work is nearly as effective as they would like. Yeah. It to be, but uh, but they keep it going as like a sign of <clears throat> commitment or something it does. like that. And, uh, like, like you know, you really got to. 
step out there and be a public right. witness. That's right. Exactly. Thing, yeah. Exactly. And uh, I have to say, I admire them uh, yeah. as as do many Catholics for yeah. their their willingness to do this. It's uh, I mean, you really have to be committed to put on a suit and uh, yeah. a tie and go from door to door when it's hot in the summertime. Yeah. And, uh, and you get rejection <clears throat> and exactly. slam doors. Exactly. Plenty and, of rejection. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of slam doors. Yeah. Um, so uh, I grew up as as a Jehovah's Witness, and uh, like so many other people, I accepted what I had learned from my parents as if it was true. Sure. I had no reason to doubt it, sure. and I did not uh, research it to find out if it was true. I didn't really have any way to, to do that. Sure. So uh, I uh, continued to live as a Jehovah's Witness in the uh, as I was approaching high school graduation, my parents were strongly encouraging me, as as they did for all male witnesses, to consider going to the world headquarters and working there, uh, yeah. which sort of uh, substituted for the college experience there. We So in 1968, I moved from Arizona to New York City. Wow. Talk about culture shock. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> We lived in, uh, I lived in Brooklyn, New York. They have a large, had, that's, it's been mostly sold now, but uh, they had a large facility in Brooklyn Heights, New York. They had a, a big printery. Now, the biggest thing that the witnesses do is publish publications about uh, these, the Watchtower and the Awake, which mm -hmm. they take from door to door, and books and Bibles, and uh, that's, that's what they do. Yeah. So uh, they have a, a staff. I think at the time that I went there, the staff was about 1,500, and it, and, it's, and it grew over the years. I was there from 1968 to 1980. Yeah, that's a good so long time. So about yeah. 12 years, almost yeah. uh, 11 and a half years. And um, I had a, a, a really marvelous experience there. Yeah. I was uh, kind of a fair-haired boy. I, I, everything went my way. I was asked to uh, I, I work my way up into the become the... Uh, superintendent of their press room printing all of those those many yeah. books uh, had about 110 men reporting to me uh, yeah. as when I was in my late 20s yeah that's, that's amazing and that's uh, yeah. and I used to go to their conventions and at their conventions I was uh, sometimes the either gave the keynote address or the public address wow. Uh, wow. which was uh, quite amazing I yeah I once spoke to tens of thousands of people in Shea Stadium <laughs> yeah yeah and I did that in English and in Spanish and in French. Uh, so uh, I'd be involved with with uh, them, and and I was I mean I just completely threw myself into it. Did you learn those languages <clears throat> after you got to Brooklyn, or did you know Spanish? Uh, Spanish, I, I knew before I came Arizona, to New York. Yeah. And uh, then when I met my wife uh, to be, uh, she was in a French uh, congregation, so I knuckled down and learned French. Uh, yeah, no one would mistake me for a native, but uh, yeah. I was spoke well enough that I could uh, give an hour discourse in, in French. So. That's, pretty, that's pretty darn good. <laughs> that's really pretty darn good. Uh, but, but the other thing was I decided when I went to the, to the headquarters that uh, I was really going to, to deal, uh, delve into the faith and really understand it. Mm -hmm. So I began to study their doctrines very, very uh, thoroughly mm -hmm. and the problem I had is that the deeper I got into their doctrines, the more problems I had with them. Mm. And uh, I even, uh, I was in regular contract, contact pardon me, with many of the uh, members of their governing body, their writing staff, because I used to work with them all the time in, in connection with The people who the, would be most knowledgeable about what they believed and why yes, they believed Yes, yes. Yeah. And they were the people that I inter interacted with in regard to printing up the Watchtower and Awake magazines. Yeah. And uh, because I was the publication side of it, yeah. uh, the the artists and the writers uh, often interacted with me. Yeah. So I would ask them questions, and I found that many of them had the same questions that I had. Oh. Uh, and uh, so eventually, uh, in the late uh, 1970s, my doubts and questions were starting to come to a head. And uh, I think, well, what kind of what kind of doubts and questions were you having? Or what well, for kind example, of... uh, Jehovah's Witnesses um, they they grew out of a small uh, movement here in the United States uh, called the Second Adventist Movement. They had been 
It had been started in the early 1800s by a man named William Miller. Mm -hmm. And the Millerites had, uh, Miller had predicted that Christ would return in 1844. And when he didn't show up, uh, they, that the the movement mostly um, dissolved, but a few diehard people decided that perhaps he really did come back, but invisibly. Uh So they became what's called the Second Adventists. And today, the two major groups that are involved with that or from those roots are the Seventh Day Adventists oh. and the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, so the Seventh Day Adventists <laughs> and the Jehovah's Witnesses they're, came they're from kind of uh, they came from the same roots. Yeah, yeah mid nineteenth uh, century. Okay, uh, the Witnesses themselves began in eighteen seventy nine. Okay, and uh, and their main focus is the end is near. Mm-hmm. And uh, their their idea is that God is going to destroy everybody on earth except for Jehovah's Witnesses and start over with a new world, a new well, life, a new order. Well, it's pretty radical. It is. It's basically yeah. uh, that's the what they see in the the uh, Noah and the Ark story. Yeah, God just destroyed yeah. everybody and started all over, and that's He's going to do that again. Yeah. So they don't believe He actually returned then and. When Miller predicted it, then or no? Well, they they uh, have changed it around a bit through okay. the years, but they basically believe that he has had sort of an invisible presence. Okay. The, but for, not not the final. Not the come, final end. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that's come. come back and forth. They uh, they've yeah. had a number of changes in their doctrines about that. Okay. But the net result of that is that their their religion is one of more negativity than positivity. In other words, uh, they. They needed to make a, a difference between themselves and other Christian uh, denominations. So yeah. they don't accept the Trinity. They don't accept the divinity of Christ. They don't accept the immortality of the soul. They don't believe in uh, hell or uh, the, the eternal separation from God. Wow. Uh, and so, and of course, there are other things that are that affect the practical life, which is. They don't salute the flag. They don't get involved in any kind of politics. They don't serve in the military or any of the armed forces. Yeah. Uh, they don't uh, serve as any kind of uh, in any kind of political office. Yeah. They don't take blood transfusions. Yeah. Well, now if you've committed to this and you actually live that way, that's what creates this uh, sense, complete sense of differentiation between yes. yourself and everybody else. Yeah, that's very strong. And yeah. once you've made that kind of a commitment, you will stick with it. Yeah. Uh, very. Yeah, you've normal. really crossed over a line. Exactly. And given your soul exactly. in a certain kind of way to believe. Commitment something. requires yeah. a certain uh, surrender. Yeah. Surrender. Surrender exactly. the mind and heart. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's behind a, a lot of the witnesses' uh, firm commitment even though if yeah. you were to look at it without without that kind of uh, yeah. commitment, you might not be willing to to stay in it. Yeah, so, it, so everybody's annihilated then because there's no immortality of the soul. Is that, that's right. Is that right. That's exactly right. And the right only the ones that, that actually continue to exist are those who are Jehovah's Witnesses. That's right. And oh, then okay. after they're, they have it divided up into a battle of Armageddon and, and then a thousand year reign. And yeah. during that thousand year reign, people from the past are going to be resurrected and given an opportunity to become Jehovah's Witnesses. And if they accept it, they'll be able to live forever. And if they don't, they, oh. they are, uh, will be annihilated again, finally. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> so, so even though there's no immortality of the soul, people are going to be resurrected from nothing and recreated or something? That's exactly right. Okay, yes, they will yeah. be recreated. They exist okay. only in God's memory after okay. they die. That's, okay, their, yeah. that's their understanding. And is it true that there's only like 144,000 that ultimately are going to be saved, or is that is that No, it isn't misunderstanding? saved, but that's kind of a misunderstanding. The 144,000 are going to go to heaven during this thousand-year reign. They're going to be joint rulers with Christ. Okay. But... The plan A for humankind yeah. is that everyone's going to live forever on Earth. Yeah, that's that's their understanding. Okay, uh, the the hundred and forty four thousand going to heaven is actually plan B. Mm-hmm. After the sin in the Garden of Eden, mm-hmm. uh, plan B was put into effect. Okay, so as you started trying to understand these things and where they came from and what the basis of them were, you were starting to have questions and doubts. Is that I right? did. Yeah, yeah, I I I had a lot of doubts and. Uh, I mean, one of the practical uh, consequences or corollaries of what they believe is that uh, 
we were encouraged very strongly not to have any children because the end is so so near. So oh, really? My wife and I were were uh, yeah. married yeah. seven years. We wanted to have a family. Yeah. And uh, some uh, or a man from uh, Sweden uh, wrote a letter to the Watchtower Society. He was a researcher, very uh, capable man, and uh, he wrote a letter which uh, in which he questioned all of the basis for the Watchtower's chronological support for their doctrine that the world was going to end or that something important had happened in 1914 and that would the world would end within a generation of that, of see, that year. Yeah. I read through that letter about three or four times and I, and I realized that the, that the Watchtower Society was not based on a strong foundation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I decided I didn't know where I wanted to go, didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah, what to believe. So yeah. I, I decided uh, I, I, to talk to my wife and bless her heart, she, she was right on board with me. Uh, I'll say this, I'm a very analytical type person. I like to read and think about things and study. And my wife is a very intuitive person. She, uh -huh. she loves to, I mean, she's a, a better prayer probably than I am. She prays about everything and she, and she gets these senses of yeah. things to do. So when I told her that I felt that I should leave the Watchtower Society, she said, hallelujah, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, we had been working there for 12 years with, as volunteers, I didn't, we didn't have any salary, so wow. I had no money or anything. You so, just got uh, like a living expense stipend. Type that's right. Thing. We lived there as uh, very similar to a monastery. Uh, we lived there uh, on their premises. Yeah. Uh, they fed us and they uh, gave us a room, and uh, yeah. that's how we and we and we worked, uh, yeah. did all kinds of things for them. Yeah. So um, it was. Uh, in 1980, in the summer of 1980, we left the Watchtower Society. I went back to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Now, my parents by that time were were traveling. My dad was a traveling minister for the witnesses. Yeah, really. They committed. had no permanent home. Yeah. So um, he used to go from congregation to congregation. Uh, they call it a circuit overseer, and and uh, visit the congregations and Strength encourage the troops them and yeah. all of that. Exactly. Yeah. So we went to Lancaster and. Um, we we lived for a few weeks with uh, glorious folks mm -hmm. until I could get a job and uh, get an apartment. Yeah, which we moved in in September, so it was about six weeks. I, I yeah. think that, uh, and I began to study. Uh, I, I trying to find out what was true. I did not want to just walk away from the witnesses. I mean, yeah. this was these are my people. Everybody yeah. I knew yeah. was a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, you know, these are all of my friends and everybody I'd known for a whole yeah. lifetime. So. Um, we, uh, I just went to work. I needed, I did a lot of overtime work and things like that. I was, I had been in the printing business at the Watchtower headquarters. So I got a job with a printing company in mm -hmm. Lidditz, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, and I uh, began to study because I felt that the right way to find truth, and this is the thing I'm going to just give you a little aside here. There are a couple of things that I came from Jehovah, that I brought from Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, if you're, if you are a Jehovah's Witness, you call yourself the way that you refer to being a Jehovah's Witness is being in the truth. Mm -hmm. So if I was wondering whether or not you're a Jehovah's Witness or if your family are witnesses, I would ask you, is your family in the truth? Mm -hmm. uh, this was turned out to be qu quite an important thing for me because mm -hmm. I left there searching for the truth. I wanted to know how things really are. Yeah. I wanted the truth. That's great. And they also have this great commitment. So I grew up with the idea that if you believe something, it should really affect your life. Yeah, it really it should. It should really make you a different person. Yeah. Well, Deacon Tom, we're going to have to take a very short break now for an important message. When we come back, we want to really hear the rest of the story. All right. For victory in life, we've got to keep focused on the goal, and the goal is heaven. The key to winning is choosing to do God's will and love others with all you've got. Sacrifice, discipline, and prayer are essential. We gain strength through God's Word, we receive grace from the sacraments. And when we fumble due to sin and it's going to happen, confession puts us back on the field. So if you haven't been going to Mass Weekly, get back in the game. We're saving your seat on the starting bench this Sunday. Welcome home. Well, Deacon Tom, uh, 
I bet so many people have always wanted to talk to somebody like you to understand better what the, the Jehovah's Witnesses are all about. And it's been absolutely fascinating. And thank you so much for sharing that. Now, now tell us, like, what as you were searching for the truth, how, how did that lead you to the Catholic Church? So I have to cover a lot of ground here in a short amount of time. I became for a, several years sort of an agnostic. Uh, I believed in God. I believed that there was a God. And I thought that the answer might be in scholarship. Mm -hmm. The problem I found with scholarship is that if you accept sola scriptura as your basis, that the scriptures are the final arbiter of everything that's orthodox and orthodoxy and orthopraxy, you, you cannot tell whether you're right or not. So I would read one explanation of, yeah. for example, why we should baptize infants. Yeah. And within it, it made sense. The hermeneutics made sense. And then I would find another one that said, no, here are the scriptures that support the idea that it should be uh, persons of an age of accountability. Yeah. You can multiply that through all yeah. of these All issues. the divisions amongst exactly. Christians about interpretation of scripture. And so ultimately, uh, I had come to the conclusion that all I could do was just try to live a good life. Yeah. Uh, that, the, that the Christian doctrine was pretty thin that there wasn't really much that were that were truly non-negotiables. Yeah. One or two issues, and then everything else was would just try to live a good life. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, we had moved into a uh, evangelical uh, environment. We were members of a Baptist church, um, and uh, my kids. We, we found a church that had a good youth program, yeah. so my kids would yeah. have uh, people to be with, and and we enjoyed the, the association there. Uh, I ultimately was asked to teach a class on um, the history of the church. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I knew very little about the history. I felt, I, I sort of believed that the church was one thing for about 100 years, and then it just sort of went out of existence until Luther came along in the re at the Reformation. Yeah. Uh, and sort of brought us back to where we were supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, so I began to accumulate books about history. And I started to read them, and the more I read, uh, I learned about these early church fathers. Mm -hmm. And the early church fathers uh, were recommended to me by a friend who had made this a, sort of a similar journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I began to read them, I was I, I fell in love with this wonderful faith. It was nothing like I had imagined. Mm. It was completely different from anything that I thought. Uh, the the faith the early faith yeah, was yeah the church was there from the beginning and it was a surprise to discover that and and not only was it there it was rich and it was uh, robust the faith was wonderful yeah to hear the way it was explained these are people that had known the apostles you yeah know? And, uh, yeah this was just wonderful so it changed my whole position on how this w worked out uh, by that time I had had a a, a difference of uh, viewpoint about predestination with a uh, with a pastor in the in this baptist church and and it seemed best to part ways and uh i moved into uh, an episcopal church very briefly mm -hmm. and i was teaching a class in in their catechism yeah uh, i think the catechism is about 28 pages in the back of the book of common prayer oh yeah it's pretty orthodox but pretty slim you yeah. know and um so uh, I just happened to come across a, a Catholic bookstore, uh, or I'm not even Catholic, I, uh, it was a used book sale is what it was, and I came across the Catholic Catechism. And here's this huge book. <laughs> I said, yeah. wow, I, I took it over to Gloria and I said, uh, look, hon, uh, this is the Catholic Catechism. So I, I started reading this book. I bought it for 50 cents, and I started reading it. That's a and, deal. And I... I, I started crying. I said, oh my gosh, I'm a Catholic. I'm a Catholic. I had never even considered the Catholic Church. Yeah. It seemed so foreign to me, yeah. but here was the faith that I had read about in the early, in the early church. Yeah, the catechism is a beautiful statement of the faith. It really, it's really wonderful. is. Yeah, it's it really wonderful. is. Yeah. I mean, every, every Catholic ought to read the catechism. Honestly. Really, absolutely, <laughs> really, yeah. It is just wonderful, and yeah. so, uh, so I, I was so convinced that the Catholic Church was right, I, but I wanted to help my family to come in. I had a son in graduate school and a son in, in uh, high school at the time. And uh, so I talked to my wife and my family, and ultimately my oldest son and uh, my wife and I were received into the church in 2006. 
and uh, my my son who my my older son who was uh, at Yale at the time uh, had met a, a bishop there who was a fellow in the same uh, college that that he was in and um, he recommended that I think about the diaconate so I uh, I, I had not no idea uh, that I would become a deacon but I applied and I thought if it's God's will that I be a deacon yeah uh, he will make it make the way open yeah. so that's what happened yeah and uh now you're a deacon now I am a deacon of and I absolutely and... love it it gets better and better each <laughs> yeah. day I'm still like a kid in a candy store honestly yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I'm reading things and uh, enjoying them very very much yeah well, well deacon Thomas thank you so much for uh, being willing to share your story it's 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 very wonderful and it's so encouraging, somebody seeking the truth, how the Holy Spirit can lead them and guide them into the fullness of truth. And now you really are in the truth, but you're bringing with you uh, valuable things that you learned as a Jehovah's Witness in terms of, you know, belief has consequences in action. Absolutely. And, and would that our Catholics were as zealous in being witnesses to the fullness of faith that the Catholic Church has that as Jehovah's Witnesses are to being witnesses to the the imperfect understanding that they have. So thank you, thank you so much for oh well, I'm so happy to be yeah. The biggest surprise, as a, as a conclusion, is yeah. that truth was not propositional; it was personal. It was a person, yeah. and that was the wonderful truth that I yeah that's, yeah that's yeah. Nice. Well, that's really great. Thank you so much. I've written a booklet called "What Happens When I Die." And we all really need to know about this. You know, Deacon Thomas shared about how there's some of the speculation about what happens after we die that you find diversity of opinion about amongst, you know, Christian churches. And the Catholic Church has a very clear understanding about what happens when we die. And it's really important to know that before we die so we can be ready to appear before the judgment seat of Christ and be in friendship with him. So we'd like to send you this booklet at no cost, just for the asking. Just call the 800 number or... Go to our website, renewalministries.net, and we'll send it right off to you. And you can be a witness to the truth of the faith. You can use this little booklet and give it to friends and relatives to awaken them to the person of Jesus Christ and the reality of his teaching. We all die, but not all deaths are the same. To die in unrepented sin is a bitter death that will only lead to the indescribable agony of eternal separation from God. But to die as a Christian, our sins forgiven, is to die a very different kind of death. A death which has now been transformed into a doorway to paradise. I've written a booklet called What Happens When I Die to help you and I end up in paradise rather than in hell. Go to our website, renewalministries.net, and simply click on the booklet or call the number on the screen and we'll send it right out to you just for the asking for free. What a gift we've been given. We can die in the love of Christ and be with Him forever.